Welcome everyone to the Royalty Exchange Investor Office Hours. My name is John Gestel. With me is Dayton O'Connor and Rob Bernhard. And today we're going to be talking about a specific catalog. Um, one thing I do want to mention is if you do have questions while we go through this, uh, please submit them through the Q&A tab rather than through the chat. The Q&A tab, it's a little bit easier for us to manage the questions. Um, so send them in there. Uh, at the end of this, we'll run through all the submitted questions. Um, and then, of course, answer any live questions that you guys have. Uh, so for this analysis, we are going to be looking at Asset 5183, uh, which is a publishing catalog featuring uh, Jeremy, Kevin Gates, Rick Ross, and a handful of other artists. Um, if you wanted to pull up the listing, by all means do. You can follow along with us as we kind of go through the analysis. Another reason why we picked this asset is because it has a lot of attractive and eyebrow-raising characteristics. Um, so it's really a good one to analyze. It's a really strong catalog. It is a bit on the more expensive side, um, but it is a really good catalog. Uh, so overview. Uh, it has a last 12 months earnings of $49,691, so pretty high-level earnings. And the three-year average is $53,237. So it's earning pretty close to its average. Um, now, we did have to do an adjustment to these earnings, which we'll get to in a minute. And so the adjusted three-year average is closer to $39,947. Um, but that still just means that our LTM last 12 months earnings are on an uptrend, which we'll also talk about. Um, other characteristics about this catalog is it's got an 11-year dollar age. Uh, dollar age, as many of you know, is a metric we use to help to determine the consistency of earnings over time. Um, higher the dollar age, typically the more consistent the earnings are. Um, so something over eight years is normally considered a high dollar age. This one being at 11, obviously, is, is a positive. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this asset is for sale for a 30-year term uh, rather than a life of rights. Um, so still a long time, but not quite a full lifetime term. Um, so we'll bake that into our considerations as well as we get through it here. Um, so these are the lifetime earnings as presented on the listing. Um, so uh, we've marked a couple things in this chart here, which you can see uh, we have the spike from early release, which we'll talk about in a minute, decline post-release, which is a very common characteristic um, for a lot of catalogs. Um, you know, the songs get released, they get popular, and then they cool off. Um, and then we have this big outlier payment in first half 2022, which is largely comprised of catch-up payments from YouTube. Um, so that's why we have our base three-year average and then our adjusted three-year average, that's accounting for this YouTube payment here. Um, when we take that out, we get that 39K three-year average. When we leave it in, it's at 59K. So it's a pretty significant impact. Um, so taking that out, obviously these earnings are much more consistent. Uh, now there's a couple of things that we still want to look at here, and that's markedly around the 2021, 2022 year, uh, where we see an increase in the royalties. Now increases in earnings for an older catalog later in its life, are certainly something you want to investigate. Um, why are these earnings increasing? What's contributing to that? Is it a one-time thing? Is this something that I should expect moving forward? These are all questions that you want to answer. Um, what we're going to be looking for here are stable earning sources, things like streaming, uh, people organically consuming the music. That's all positive. That leads to our consistent baseline. Things that we'll want to be cautious of are one-time payments, catch-ups like we've already removed, um, maybe TikTok or other short form media that doesn't have a long lifespan, TV and film placements in like advertisements that won't last long. Those are the kinds of things we'll be looking for. Um, so we did build a cash flow table for this. Um, our goal with these is to beat treasury bonds. You know, that's the other consistent cash flow that people normally use as a marker. We like to double that. Our royalty exchange market average is around a 13% return. Um, so this cash flow is built to meet that 13% return. Um, one thing that you'll notice here is that for the first several years, the earnings projections are increasing. That's based on the current trend of the catalog. So we noticed in the those last couple quarters that the earnings have been going up. So we bake in a conservative decline to that increase, uh, which is why after year five, you see those earnings start to come back down. And then we bake in a, a decay rate. Um, now, in year 10, because this is an IRR calculation, we uh, formalize a liquidity event. Now, given the age of this catalog and the term, we assume a 6x multiple at the sale. Uh, that's why this is start here. So that 384K 
resale is assuming a 6x on the LTM. If this were a life of rights catalog, that would be an 8x. Um, but since we do have a reduced term, we do reduce reduce the resale as well. And that all comes out to a 13% return at a $400,000 offer, uh, which is right around the median for this asset. I believe the median is like 418K or something like that. Um, so a pretty good offer for, for the median for this catalog. Um, so earnings behavior. We talked about that growth trend in, in 2021 leading into 2022. So we want to investigate what that is, where it's from, and what's happening with that. So we'll get a little deeper into the earnings here and we can see streaming, the green bar is the primary contributor. Um, that's great. That's exactly what we're looking for. Um, we can also rule out TV and film. As you can see, the biggest TV and film contribution was in 2019. There's just that one little block there. Um, but beyond that, there's not much um, in the way of, of TV and film placements. There's a little bit of sync in first half of 22, but again, pretty negligible. Um, so largely streaming, which is exactly what we're, what we're looking for. Now, when we get even further into the details, we can see that streaming is broken out into really three different pieces here. Uh, we have streaming synchronization, streaming performance, and streaming mechanical. And we'll get into what all those are, but that's what makes up those streaming blocks. Um, so first, streaming mechanical. Um, streaming mechanical is basically the mechanical royalty, right? And that's created from the actual construction of the music, as I believe is the the origination point of that term. Rob, can you confirm for me that's when they were creating CDs, vinyl, that's the mechanical side, right? Yeah, well, it actually goes all the way back to to player pianos. There where you go. They took they took sheet music and was able to to create a mechanical copy to feed it through a player piano, um, and that's that's where that term comes from. Got it. Awesome. Um, and so basically, that's just evolved into streaming, right? Because streaming is the same function. You take an existing copy of music and you play it through another medium. Uh, so that's that mechanical. Then the performance, exactly what you would expect, people playing the song. Uh, and then streaming synchronization. Uh, so streaming synchronization uh, for this catalog is a designation that Sony, who's the, the publisher for this catalog, uses for basically YouTube. Um, now, the reason why it gets the synchronization designation is because YouTube is a video platform. Um, so sync inherently is music synchronized to video. That's where the term comes from. Um, and since it's that specific platform, that's where that comes from. Um, so one thing about the streaming synchronization that we want to note is that in the 2017, 2018 spikes, it's a huge contribution, um, an alarming contribution. Now, that's far enough in the past that it's not something that we would want to bake into our cash flow table moving forward, but something we would want to understand. Now, in the research that we did, the only thing that really looked like it could contribute to that was in 2017, YouTube changed its guidelines for what gets monetized. Um, so a lot of these videos were popular songs. Um, shortly after their releases, you know, they would have qualified for the the monetization, the new monetization rules, uh, which could have contributed to these these payments. Uh, but there's no way for us to really know for certain, and since it doesn't impact our cash flow recently. It's not something we'll really worry about. Um, but again, as far as the exercise goes, there's things to look out for. This is a perfect example. Um, you want to know what stuff it is and where it's coming from. Um, so next year, we'll talk about the MLC. Um, so the MLC stands for the Mechanical Licensing Collective. Uh, it was created with the Music Modernization Act, which took was ratified in, what, 2019, I believe it was. Um, and basically, they were to create a centralized place for mechanical licenses to make it easier for publishers and different companies to, to hand out those licenses. Um, so the idea was to make the royalty collection and reporting more accurate. Um, now, their first payments occurred in second half of 2021. And that's right when we start to see that increase in earnings, largely from the streaming mechanical. Uh, so in our next chart here, you'll see this is just the earnings from streaming mechanicals in those same periods. A pretty significant uptrend in that same second half 2021 leading into 2022, 2023. Um, so the effect of the Mechanical Licensing Collective is pretty significant. Um, if you go to their website, you can see they have their annual reports every year. They've been growing pretty significantly over the years. Um, their whole goal is to open up what's considered black box royalties, which is in the music industry, 
um, a, a pretty known phenomena of unknown royalties. Um, and so I believe when I read the, the the report, they were saying they found an extra $50 million in royalties paid out from black box royalties because they have this central location for people to register their works. Uh, and that should only improve as they continue to grow. Again, it's a relatively new um, company, um, but the impact is already pretty tangible, um, especially when, when looking at the earnings specifically. Um, next, let's talk about the Copyright, copyright Royalty Board, which is something we've talked about a lot in the last year. Um, again, this impacts the uh, stream of mechanical royalties, but notably right now, the changes are only happening in domestic, U.S. domestic stream of mechanicals. Um, so basically, along with the improved collections, uh, the Copyright Royalty Board and, you know, the various stakeholders in streaming, so like the, the, the streaming services like Spotify, Apple Music, uh, the major publishers, they've all been arguing, trying to figure out what is the appropriate royalty payout rate. Um, for people streaming, for the streaming mechanical royalty. Um, so this is known as the Phono Records 2 and Phono Records 3. I believe it's the laws is what you would consider them, Rob. I don't know what the proper term is. Uh, uh, it's just the, the rate, the rate proceedings. Just the proceedings. Okay. Uh, well, basically they were arguing what those proceedings should be as people adopt streaming. Um, so the music industry can keep up with technology. Um, before these rate increases, I believe it was a 10.5% uh, of streaming revenue gets allocated to royalties. Uh, and just in the last year, they changed that headline royalty rate as follows for the prior periods. So 2018 should be 11.4% instead of 10.5, then 12.3, 13.3, 14.2, and 15.1. Uh, but again, these are all retroactive. Uh, so all these prior periods that we have data for these streaming mechanical payments, these are the rates that should have been applied to those royalty payouts. Now, just doing some rough calculations, this is what that prior chart, this chart looks like with those increases. Um, and this is set into law, this is going to happen. So these are catch-up payments that you can pretty handily expect. Um, according to the CRB's website, those catch-up payments are expected to hit in February of next year. Um, there are some caveats where the streaming services may have to pay late fees if they don't make those payments in time. Um, so that's, again, more possible upside. Um, and then you'll notice in 2023 of this chart that it's leveled out. That's because we're in the new um, rate environment in 2023, uh, which should be 15.35%, but that will all be accurate moving forward, just these catch-up payments that, that are coming. Now, this all works out to around $18,000 in payments coming uh, that are going to get paid out to this catalog. Um, so that impacts our cash flow table that we had earlier. We had it around a 13%. With that same offer, it, it bumps it up a whole percentage point to 14%. Um, so that first year payment, expected payment goes from like 50K to like 70K almost, 52 to 70. Uh, so it's a pretty significant increase. Um, again, all this stuff you could find online, uh, the rate proceedings and the increases, um, that's all on federalregister.gov if you want to go check that stuff out. Um, yeah, this is this is what the expected earnings will be for this catalog. All these increases should be coming in the next, you know, six months or so. And uh, and John, just just a little context on that. On, yeah, on please. The reason the reason that uh, we're expecting catch up payments is because when the the original rates were set ahead of 2018, um, there were a bunch of appeals filed, and once the appeals were filed, um, the digital service providers had the option of either paying at what the, the rates were set at or what the existing rates were, knowing that once this all kind of shook out, um, they would have to make catch-up payments if these rates ultimately were affirmed and then they were. Um, so that's what's requiring some of these uh, DSPs to, uh, to make the catch-up payments. And then notably for uh, the 2023 through 2027 period, they actually settled on those rates. So there will be no fights over those. So, and it's pretty, like you said, the 15.35 will be pretty flat uh, over the next five years um, without any um, appeals. And so that that's kind of already been settled, which is a good thing for uh, being able to predict what, what the next five years are going to look like. Yep. And again, this is just for the U S domestic stream mechanicals. 
Um, so if you're analyzing a catalog and you're looking at the streaming mechanicals, just make sure that you're designating the U.S. domestic out of the international. The international, we'll see how that all goes. Yeah, it's possible they could follow suit with the U.S. It's possible they won't. Um, yeah, it's kind of a larger question, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, but this is for the U.S. and this is primarily a U.S. earning catalog. Okay, so we've pretty much figured out why the earnings for this catalog are on the upswing. They look good. It looks consistent. Uh, we've got a lot of positive stuff on the horizon for the earnings. Um, now let's look at the content itself. Um, this is always kind of something to take with a grain of salt when it comes to royalty assets. Um, normally we say, hey, don't consider the content, the earnings or the earnings. That's what you should be looking at. Um, but that being said, you know, stuff happens. So you're still dealing with celebrity as it were. Um, so it's good to know who the contributors are. You want to make sure that they're still active um, and they're still relevant. You know, they're still releasing music. Um, so let's get into the content. There are two primary artists that are contributing to the top earners of this catalog. The first is Jeremy. Um, most people would know Jeremy, I think from his song birthday sex, which is very popular. Obviously you can see it on his, his Spotify listings here. Um, now when we investigate an artist, we like to use chart metric. They do a pretty good job of looking at streaming stats. Um, but then you also want to look at things like, you know, their, their social media profiles. If there's any active litigation happening with them. We didn't find much for these artists. Um, so that's a positive. Uh, so we just looked at the streaming numbers largely because that's what's most relevant to our earnings, which is primarily streaming. Um, so for Jeremy, we looked at his playlist access and evolution. Um, it's been leveling out, but on the upswing, um, which is something we want to see. It's something we would expect for high dollar edge catalogs. If he's kind of plateauing for his playlisting, it means he's getting kind of secure in where he's falling. Uh, but he's also still actively touring actively releasing music, uh, which are all positives for a catalog. Uh, if an artist is active, that means they're engaging their fan base, they're encouraging listens. If they're performing, you know, that's another opportunity for, for getting new fans and, and increasing their listenership, which all contributes to the earnings. Again, all strong factors that you want to see in an artist um, as far as, you know, what's going to contribute to their royalties. Um, Kevin Gates is the other major artist, or I should say major earner, um, same thing as Jeremy. He's still actively releasing music. He's still actively touring. Again, all positives. Um, there's also solid uh, solid association between these artists, uh, as well as the other artists listed in the headline of the catalog itself. Rick Ross. Um, I'm not remembering who the other one is, but, uh, you know, big, big artists. 50 Cent, right? Um, so, yeah. Other big artists can lead to overlap between listenership, can lead to discovery of, of new music from new fans, all positives for the catalog. Um, so that just about covers this analysis. Again, this is a little bit of a abridged version of the full analysis we did for the All Access membership. Um, but hopefully this exercise was helpful as far as walking through things you want to look at for a catalog. Um, again, we looked at the overall earnings period over period. It looked at trends there. We built a cash flow table. Uh, to kind of give us a, a, a target rate of return uh, around 13%. We looked at the specific earnings and where they're coming from, uh, streaming, TV, film. We looked at where those specific earnings are being generated, whether it's streaming mechanicals, whether it's uh, streaming performance. We looked at why those might be increasing and what they might be doing. We looked at even further back at the prior uh, streaming synchronization royalties as to what those were. Uh, we looked at the catalogs themselves. We looked at the horizon of streaming. We've looked at a lot, a lot of different stuff here. Um, but that all points to this catalog. This catalog is a pretty strong one. It's one that we really, really like. Um, caveat, of course, being the 30-year term. But, you know, even with 30 years, assuming a 13% return should do great. Um, so if this is something that's in your wheelhouse, take a look. Run your own analysis. We always encourage that. Um, hopefully this walkthrough helped a lot. Uh, all right. So let's start with, uh, the Q &A Hey John, here. while you're still here, yeah, go back to that, uh, the cash flow. Ben had a question on, on what's the, uh, what's the, the reasoning behind the assumption for a 10 year exit. Dan, you want to talk about the, uh, cash flow table? 
Yeah, sure. So um, with the cash flows that we're presenting here, the way that we're assuming the value of this catalog past year 10 is by applying a terminal value or an exit multiple. Uh, and in this case, we're just using a 6x. Uh, when you're doing your own analysis, you may want to apply uh, different types of exit values at the end of that, uh, but that's the way that we find uh, we're able to assess uh, the value for an asset where we're looking at a 30-year term or a life of rights term. Okay. Hopefully that answers, answers your question. Uh, also, Katara, thanks. Uh, thanks, Katara. <laughs> I, I knew it was Jeremiah. I just, John was on a roll, so I didn't want to jump in. And stop Sorry, try, trying to get through the content here. Um, okay. Well, hopefully, if you're a, a fan of Jeremiah, that this is makes this catalog even more attractive. You know, that's the other part of royalties that's, that's fun, right? Is that if you enjoy the content, then it, you basically get paid for listening to music you already listened to, um, which a lot of people... <laughs> take that approach um if you guys have other questions please just send them in we're going to start getting to the submitted questions now um let me pull those up quickly here uh, so we had a bunch that's so around 30 here um a lot came from uh, international investors um so if you were an international investor great um first one here is how do you declare your earnings to the french state um, we can't really answer tax questions. Um, you would be signing a W-8 BEN when you purchase with us, and that would account for international tax withholding, uh, but I'd have to point you towards your tax advisor. Uh, a couple of live questions here. Okay, well, let's get into these first. How do you assess the lifetime of a royalty of an artist who is not alive anymore? That's a good question. Um, so the life of rights, you would want to look at if that's still applicable, uh, especially if the artist's past. Uh, so life of rights is determined by the life of the last surviving artist who contributed to the work. So it's not necessarily the performing artist. Um, so you'd want to investigate who still could be earning a royalty from that and then base your uh, cash flows as far as you know when the royalty will end off of that. Uh, also, the release date of the content will matter because uh, the copyright life of rights timeline changed in the 70s rob do you remember when the, the year yeah was? yeah 1978 so anything after 1978 um the copyright protection is for the life of the last surviving author plus 70 years and before that it kind of did bounce around but i guess a general kind of rule of thumb could be 95 years from the date of publication if it came out before 1978 so yeah so Research that. That's that's really the the short answer. Um, from Jerome here, how did you get from thirty nine k to roughly fifty five k? So you're looking at the three year average versus the LTM. Um, so the LTM was forty nine k, uh, and based on the growth that we've been seeing, that's that's how that that fifty five k. Um, oh, are you talking about for the, the the overall three year averages? It's because of the uh, the outlier adjustment. So that's that. Uh, that outlier YouTube catch up payment that we see here. Uh, so we remove that because it's a one-time payment and we don't want to use one-time payments when building our analysis because we're trying to look at consistent cash flow. Uh, and there's something like this is going to throw off our projections. It's going to throw off our rates. It's going to throw off everything. Um, so we remove it all together, which is how we get from the, the 53 to the 39. Because uh, the 39K is a much better representation of the moving three-year average for the earnings that we would expect to be generated. Now, outlier catch up stuff like that you still would be entitled to those payments were they to come through for this catalog so just consider it upside uh, but as far as you know building projections for something that we wanted to invest in we don't want to take that into consideration um, i hope that answers your question uh next one here you pulled out the youtube adjustment do you have a general baseline for what percentage of earnings you consider significant enough to pull out for a listing it's a good question um I'm not sure I would allocate a percentage to it. Um, maybe if you looked at period by period stuff and saw like a significant increase and then anything like that, that caught your eye, if you wanted to do a deeper investigation, that's probably worthwhile. Um, I don't know, Dayton, do you have any 
qualifications for a percent increase you would consider outlier? That's a great question. Uh, what I find a lot of value in is taking a look at the data itself and not necessarily looking at, like the charting here is obviously pretty helpful because you can see these extreme examples that pop up for the, what we point out for the YouTube payment, uh, what you see with the spike in the releases, and that's going to co come through in the earnings. But if you're diving into the data that we're applying on a listing itself, you're going to see with a lot more granularity where there might be some outlier distributions that are not necessarily showing up at the chart because it still comes in within the overall average of the distribution. So for some of these listings, you might see the effect of releases on the earnings. You might see the effect of sync payments, adjustments, settlements, these one-time payments. Uh, so I don't know if I'd look at it like on a percentage increase, decrease basis, but if you're putting in a bid on an asset, I would take a look at the data first and do you know a granular look in the LTM in the three year to see if you can pull out some of those outstanding distributions that are going to represent non-recurring payments, one-time payments that you would not affect, yeah. not necessarily want to bake into uh, the future cash flows that you can count on for this asset if you're trying to acquire it. Yeah, I, I would say looking at stuff like trends in the origination point of the royalties and the use case, that's a great start. Because you know when we take a look at this stuff here, we can see pretty clearly where the outliers are. Um, if we had left in that adjustment, it would have been a big blue bar in that first half 20, or 22 payment. Uh, it would have looked similar to the, the first half, uh, second half and first half of 2017, 2018. It would have been a huge blue bar like that. Stuff like that, anything that's noticeable like that, that's what you're looking for. Little fluctuations are really to be expected. Um, I mean, you can see it pretty clearly here. Um, so like, yeah, I like the date says it. allocating a percentage to it is tough. Um, yeah, really what you're looking at is is the use case. Um, so when you see anything, anything at all that catches your eye, you want to look closer. Um, yeah. Look at the specific payments. That, that if you're looking on a quarter to quarter detail. basis, then, then there might be a change that happens that represents like the new normal for the catalog that you wouldn't necessarily want to bake out, right? Yeah. And that's also why we ran through this analysis the way we did, right? We looked at the earnings themselves. We noticed trends that we wouldn't expect and we investigated where those trends came from. In this case, it's the MLC and the CRB and the impacts they're having on the music industry, which are, again, are all positive. So that's, that's great. Um, but as far as the exercise goes, that's a good approach, right? Look at the earnings, Notice things that you might want to consider that might be unusual out of what you would expect when, when developing your cash flow table and investigate that, see where, where you sit with that. Uh, next question is here. Which are the main risks to be aware of while making an offer? Um, well, we've talked about a bunch of the risks here, outlier payments, one-time payments, things like that. Um, artists that are kind of nose diving is something to consider. I mean, I'm sure you all are familiar with R. Kelly and what happened with him. Um, stuff like that is always a risk. Um, really, we want to look at the music consumption behaviors. Um, so declining artists are a thing. New releases are something you want to take note of. In this case, it's a pretty old catalog. It's not something we have to worry about quite as much. Um, but if you had a, a track in this catalog that was, say, released in 2022 and really inflating the earnings, that's something that you want to consider as well. Now, our dollar raise metric will weight the release of a song um, and its contribution to the LTM earnings. Um, so the dollar raise, again, normally a really good metric to use. Um, but yeah, things like that. Uh, all, all the stuff that we've talked about uh, over this uh, over this webinar. Rob, Dayton, anything else you want to talk about for risks? No, okay. Uh, next question here. Generally, as interest rates rise, could we expect to see purchase prices decrease significantly? You know, that's a good question. Um, we've actually got this question a bunch in the high interest rate environment, um, which I don't have a good answer for, honestly. We kind of expected prices to go down just because cost of capital was going to go up, but honestly, they haven't. Um, prices have been pretty pretty much at the same level, if not increasing over the last year, as far as multiples go. Um, my suspicion is that's because 
royalties, entertainment devices, they're normally pretty insulated from traditional market fluctuations, stuff like that. People aren't going to stop listening to music because, you know, Apple's doing good or bad, right? Like, um, I don't know, Dayton, Rob, do you guys have thoughts on, on that? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I guess people might be more conservative with their offers compared to, you know, treasury bonds. But again, you know, like royalty, royalty payments purchased through royalty exchange have performed so far beyond T-bonds. That's, it's kind of like a apples and oranges comparison. So um, yeah, I mean, stuff's still performing really well. Yeah. I mean, there's an effect of, of the macro on the broader economy at large, but you know, the, the rates that you'd expect to see from some of these royalty assets, stuff that's coming in from streaming, from mechanical, that, that's expected to grow based on forecasts of the industry, you know, it's it's not quite the same thing as a percentage return that you're going to get over a period of time when you're investing in a fixed income asset. Uh, next question here. For someone who's brand new to this, what's the best way to get started? Would you need to match the offer? Or what would be the buy-in, et cetera? Um, okay, so first thing to address here, all catalogs and royalty exchange have to be purchased in their entirety. So you can't buy just a piece of something. You have to buy the whole thing. Um, now, the best approach strategy that I can offer is determine what your range would be. And that's, again, why we use that cash flow table, because we wanted to develop kind of a rough range. Um, and then offer below that and then negotiate up. That's obviously a pretty solid approach, right? You want to get the lowest price you can. You're trying to negotiate with someone who wants the highest price. You want to meet in the middle somewhere. It's relatively fair. Try not to exceed what you can afford because you do have to pay for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, start low and, and offer up the, the sites designed so that there is a counter offer exchange happening. Um, so when you make your offer, offer conservatively and prepare to meet it at a fair price. Organic price discovery is the name of the game here. Um, so yeah, expect expect a counter offer negotiation. Rob Dayton, do you guys have anything to suggest? Yeah, I mean, I take a huge step back. Like if you're if you're truly brand new, um, go go read everything that we've we've got on the site. You know, our, yep. um, we've got a lot of material out there that's that's kind of breaks things down and in, into as detailed of pieces as you want. Um, the blog has a, just a ton of good information to kind of familiarize yourself with royalties in general. Um, you know, these these webinars typically people find helpful and then um, just look at the listings. Like everything Royalty Exchange has done is on the marketplace. It's all public, all the offers. You, you can see past deals that we've done, what those sold for. Um, if if they are reposted in the secondary market, you can see how they've performed since the most recent sale. Like there's a ton of information, and and I think one of the the probably trickier parts is to wrap your head around all that. So if you can get a baseline understanding of of what royalties are and and um, it, what what your appetite is is in your investment portfolio and and how much you can allocate, then you can start thinking about actually getting involved. And that's that's when the the offer. Um, interactions would happen um in, in determining what you think a good offer is and again anything anything you want to know can be learned on the website just by watching listings i think yeah that's a great suggestion um and then yeah you don't need to match the offer but you can some of this stuff gets really competitive um so you know if you are competing with another investor and you are comfortable with the list price sometimes that's the right strategy but like rob said Make sure whatever you're doing fits with your portfolio allocation um, and is right for you. And yeah, learning learning how it all works is definitely the best way to, to approach that. Uh, another question here. Can you talk a little about decay rates and earnings? Why none for this catalog? Uh, so we actually did bake in decay rates. Um, in years five to 10, there was a baked in decay rate. And even for the growth rate, which we have to adopt because the catalog is growing, we even then bake in a pretty substantial decay rate to the growth. I believe it's like a 25 or 30% decay per year in that growth. Um, so we take a conservative slant, but ultimately the kind of decay rate that you bake into your analysis is up to you and what you think. Uh, we have our model, which is proven to be pretty accurate. Again, a lot of this stuff is 
available in the all access membership through the full analysis, which we aren't going to offer here. Um, but yeah, I mean, look at the trends for the actual earnings. The earnings are the earnings, right? That's the actual direct reflection of the consumption behavior, what's happening with the catalog. Uh, what you do with that information is is kind of up to you, but yeah, how you how you apply a decay rate will be determined by the age of the catalog, what the earnings are doing, you know, all of the macro factors that we've talked about here today. Um, Dayton, anything you want to add in regards to decay? No. Okay, great. Uh, question here. Where do I get the long-term historical financial data for a catalog? On your web page, I only see data, data back to 2020 for this catalog, for example. Any other sources? Um, so for this catalog, there is data back to 2014. Uh, as you can see on our chart here, this all this analysis was done from the raw data file downloaded from the listing. Uh, if you're looking at data back to 2020, you're probably just looking at the summary stuff that we have there, but the raw data file is downloadable on every listing on Royalty Exchange, so you can get that full life of earnings. Um, now, keep in mind, not every royalty payor offers the full lifetime historical financial data. Uh, so we'll off, we'll provide everything that we have available, but sometimes, you know, say a catalog's 20 years old and it's from a publisher who only offers us eight years of data, right? That can happen. And then we'll offer the eight years of data because that's all we have. Um, so that can't happen. But in this case, we've got all the way back to 2014 through the raw data file. Uh, you will need to have an active royalty exchange account to download the raw data file. So just make sure you're signed in and it should be right at the top of the list. Next question here, what dollar age do you perceive to be a good dollar age? So I don't like to use the term good in relation to dollar age. And that's really because one isn't necessarily better than the other as far as young versus old. They each offer something different. Um, younger catalogs can be more volatile, uh, but they can also yield a ton more in the early life. Uh, so it's like some of our highest return catalogs have been young catalogs because the earnings didn't decay as much as people thought. And so there was another big payment, stuff like that, right? So stuff like that can happen. Older catalogs are typically more sought after uh, because they're more consistent. More consistent I mean, everyone's looking for consistent cash flow over a long period of time. So that's a pretty common approach. Um, so they just offer different things to your portfolio. It's really up to you and what kind of a portfolio you're trying to build and what your investment goals are as to what you would consider a good dollar age or a good investment. Uh, but I wouldn't say one is good or bad or one is better than the other. They just offer different things. Um, Dana, Rob, anything you guys want to add to that? I mean, not you just good classify or bad. eight oh, as ahead, old, Rob. right? Yeah, eight plus is what, what we would consider relatively old, right? And at that point, the the catalog is entered into its its long tail of distribution. So not good, but you know, highly predictable, and that predictability translates into uh, a higher multiple, a, a, a greater premium than investors are placing on that asset relative to younger assets. Yep. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, next one here. For the UK earnings listings, it says payments would be converted to USD. Could they be paid directly into a UK Great British Pounds account instead? Great question. Something we're working on. Uh, this is a limitation with our admin partner right now, which we have been investigating for a while. Um Hopefully soon we will have an option to just directly deposit in the currency received. At the moment, it's not something we can currently offer, um, but stay tuned. We are actively investigating ways to offer that. It's been requested quite a bit. Um, so hopefully soon. I know that will be a significant change for a lot of investors. We'll save them a couple percentage points in their returns. So yeah, something we're, we're looking to, to do. Uh, will this recording be viewable later? Yes, we record all of these and we post them on the site. Um, so you'll find them on the the blog page like Rob mentioned earlier. Um, normally, we'll go up shortly after we, we, rec we record them. Uh, also on YouTube, you can find them there too. 
Can you talk us through your fee when selling slash exiting a catalog? What is your cut of the exit proceeds? Um, so on royalty exchange, the resale fee is 8% of the final sale price of the catalog. Um, so it's not too bad. Uh, for all access members, it's six and a quarter percent rather than eight uh, percent. So it's even cheaper. Uh, that's that's if that's if something was originated on our site and you're reselling something that right. you purchased on the royalty exchange marketplace. The typical fee for origination is fifteen percent. Yeah, just assuming that it's a catalog you would buy with us, presuming you would sell with us, since we are kind of the best place to sell any of this stuff, uh, biggest market for it. Um, hopefully that answers your questions. Any of the live ones, please submit them. Uh, we do have a bunch more of these submitted questions that we'll run through here. Uh, we already talked about declaring winnings for the French states. So that was done. What does it take to become a verified investor? Uh, just fill out the invest, uh, the investor verification form, very straightforward. Uh, and we'll get you processed through the system. What is the largest growth trend you have seen in the last six to 12 months? <laughs> I'm not sure I could point to one. Um, Robert Dayton, do you guys have any thoughts on that? The largest growth trend we've seen in the last six to 12 months. I don't know. I mean, if we're, if we're counting on like a quote unquote, where earnings are expected to, to come from in a catalog historically and going forward, I mean, we touched on the CRP rate increase in, in U.S. domestic mechanical streaming you know, there's going to be significant value in those retroactive payments once they come out. The MLC coming online has represented significant value for catalogs that are earning those royalties uh, in the U.S. Uh, I would say that. I mean, <laughs> you know, you can yeah. also point to any catalog where it goes from zero to, you know, a thousand is the highest growth rate. <laughs> uh, but I would, I would count on the the domestic streaming story. Uh, yeah, from... that, that's, that's a good answer. That's yeah. probably where look at publishing catalogs with domestic stream mechanical and yeah we that's definitely true as noted in this catalog we look at it today i mean it's showing pretty significant growth uh can this market address young students with low investment capital depends on what you quantify as low i mean on on the royalty exchange marketplace on the low end stuff will normally sell in the five to ten thousand dollar range um that's really just because we have certain limitations around um, what can get listed. It does have to exhibit a history of royalty earnings at a certain level, depending on who the payor is, uh, in order to get through that stuff, get through the due diligence and all that. Um, it'll normally end up pricing at a couple thousand dollars just to justify the however much money is generated. Um, so if that's you consider that low, then it can if you are looking for more like a hundred dollar investment, uh, I'm afraid not. Uh, next question here. Um, how do I properly assess risk? We we kind of talked about that. Um, so I think we're, we're good on that one. Uh, can royalties be a stock like NVIDIA future predictions of 100% return in 2024? I mean, potentially. Really all depends on the catalog you buy, right? Um, we've seen stuff increase 100% in a year. We've seen stuff decrease 100% in a year. So it all depends on the catalog. Uh, do you or will you have a calendar on your site for when the webinars are held? We don't currently. Uh, when you sign up for them, it'll show all the dates uh, that they're available. So that's really the best, the best option. Um, but we do one a quarter. Uh, it ends up being the second Tuesday at the start of each quarter, I believe. No, we're not in the second month of every quarter. Um, so it's, you know, mid-month of each quarter. Uh, next question here. How do you procure up-and-coming artists for the platform? Do you actively look for unreleased catalogs? Um, so we can't work with unreleased music because, again, it needs to have a history of royalty earnings. Uh, we do have full-time staff that does work in the music community uh, talking to artists about you know possibly selling royalties how it all works stuff like that the opportunities that that exist um but uh yeah a lot of the artists who come to us have heard about us work with someone who worked with us had a good experience uh, so a lot of it's referrals a lot of it's word of mouth a lot of it's organic discovery um and then yeah our full-time team um 
reaching out to people too. So combination of all of those. Uh, next question here. One, I'm Italian. How does taxation work for royalties? Again, we already answered that one. Can't really speak to taxes. Uh, you get a W-A-T-E-N. Uh, is it possible to participate in an auction pro quota? Um, not really, no. Um, Rob, you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's the same kind of question about fractionalization and can you purchase a, a piece of a royalty stream? Um, no, we we only offer one-to-one -one sales. Um, we try to take a, a, per, a conservative approach from a security standpoint so that these things uh, are not considered securities. It's just a, a straight assignment of income from one person to another. Um, so we had several questions about that, um, but that's that's generally generally the reason why we only offer one-to-one -one sales. Uh, next question here. When do you receive payments from from royalties purchased? Um, so distribution frequency. Uh, distribution frequency varies. Uh, it really depends on which company is, is collecting and providing the royalties, right? So we'll work with companies like ASCAP and BMI, which are performers' rights organizations. We'll work with major publishers. We'll work with record labels, digital distributors. We'll work with everybody. Um, but they each pay on different frequencies. Uh, the most common payment frequency we see is a quarterly basis. So, you know, four payments a year. Uh, but there are some assets that will pay monthly. There's some that will pay just once a year. Uh, on every listing on Royalty Exchange, uh, you'll find a, a chart that denotes the period by period payments. And you can see the frequency through that. Um, so it varies. Uh, how would an artist register their music on your website? Would they need to register from CSAC or BMI first? Uh, yeah, so you have to have already royalties coming in uh, and then depending on who's paying you the royalties we would look at that um, and that's kind of how we would work through the due diligence and if we can list stuff like that uh next question here does the dividend per share of songs vary per artist are artists seeking to sell their catalogs through this platform so the dividend per share of songs isn't really a question we can answer i mean yes the contribution of earnings per song varies depending on what the song is and how the royalties are collected. Um, but it's not, it's not a per share thing. Each asset in itself is a share of the collective royalties. Um, so it's not really broken out that way. Um, are artists seeking to sell their catalog to this platform? Uh, yeah, quite a bit. Um, every week we have new, new stuff going live. Every week we're working with new artists. There's a ton out there. There's a ton we've worked with. There's a ton we, we work with many times. Um, so yeah. The more people that learn about it, the more people that want to work with us. So it's constantly growing. Uh, meaning of dollar age. Uh, we kind of talked about this already, just in the analysis. Um, it's basically a metric we use to help to determine the consistency of earnings based on the age of the catalog, weighting the contribution of the royalties in the different songs. Um, we do have a, uh, a guide which gets into it a bit more specifically. I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, let me just pull it up. Um, this is going to be probably the best explanation of how royalties works. Uh, in the chat, or not royalties, works, how the dollar age works. Take a look at that article. It's got our formula for how we calculate it, what gets considered in it. Um, that's available on the blog on Royalty Exchange in the investor section. So you can always take a look at it. Um, but that's going to be the best explainer that, that I can offer you. Next question here for life of rights for lifetime rights purchase. Do you receive the ability to use the property for yourself? No, you don't. Rob, can you elaborate for us? Yeah. So, so virtually every, every asset you see on royalty ex exchange is a, a passive royalty asset, meaning you're just buying the rights to the income. You're not buying an interest in the copyright itself. Typically those are still uh, owned and or controlled by uh, a major music publisher or label. Um, sometimes there'll be, you know, a smaller uh, individual uh, writer or, or artist who, who still owns their rights. But the idea is, is as an investor, um, you're kind of investing alongside uh, the the publisher or label who who has experience in the industry has has been looking over uh, the the copyrights for a while. It's kind of their job to to monetize and, and make sure uh, that the uh, the asset is being uh, uh, handled properly and, and making money. Um, 
and so that that's kind of the thesis behind royalty exchange. Um, really, there's not a lot an investor could do to to bump their uh, their earnings. They don't have the right to 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 issue further licenses. You could create a bunch of playlists with stuff that you bought and and make fractions of pennies uh, every every month if you wanted. Uh, but no, typically typically it's a, it's strictly a passive income. Next question here is just open to all nationalities. Yeah, there's no limit as far as I'm aware of for different investors in the world. Um, just keep in mind that you'll have to go through a verification process. You'll have to pay for an asset within two business days. That's a pretty strict rule on the site. As long as you can meet those, yeah, it doesn't matter where you come from. Um, and you got to pay in US dollars. Um, but yeah, otherwise, no limit. Uh, what are the average returns of this type of investment? Our, our site-wide annualized return right now is around 13%, uh, which is why we use that as the baseline of our analysis here. We want to match that 13%. Um, so yeah, right around a 13% return. Any upcoming syndicate investment opportunities every time we get one of these? Not at the moment. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, our private syndicates is one of the ways that we do fractionalize assets. It's pretty rare that we do them. Uh, and normally it's for pretty big stuff. Prior private syndicates have included Cage the Elephant, Dire Straits, Eminem, big artists like that. Um, if we do have one of those that come up, you'll hear about it. We'll send a lot of communications about it, um, but they're pretty rare. We haven't done one in a number of years. Uh, can you buy for another person? That's a good question. Rob, what do you think? Uh, no. So the, the, the name on the purchase agreement has to match the name that you registered with, uh, for your account. Um, if you bought it and then fully funded, um, the transaction was complete and then you wanted to, for example, gift it to somebody else, you could do it that way. Um, but essentially the, the name that, that you're bidding with and register with has to match uh, what you end up purchasing with. Great. Uh, okay. Sorry, question for a new investor. What's the mechanism to guarantee performance of the obligations by the seller? Rob, you want to talk about that one? Yeah. So the, the way, the way that the marketplace works is, is that the seller posts their, their royalty stream for sale. And once you purchase it, um, the contract is between the investor and the seller, but royalty exchange facilitates the actual assignment of the royalties. Royalty exchange becomes the administrator of the payments. So um, we have a record of who has purchased uh, the royalty. We receive the royalties from the payors and then pay them through to the investors. So aside from uh, signing the paperwork, um, there is not a ton uh, that the uh, seller needs to do. One thing that we do is is we hold all funds until the distributor of the royalties has confirmed that that assignment is in place. And then as a backup protection, a lot of times a sale will take place uh, very close to when a new distribution comes out. So when we submit that assignment to the distributor, oftentimes they won't have time to update the payee, which means that the seller will receive the next payment. And as the investor, as of the date you purchase, you're entitled to all payments that, that come after that after that date. So as the protection, what we do is even after we pay out the initial proceeds to the seller, we hold back 10% of the purchase price until royalty exchange has received the payment and we verify that it's correct from the distributor, knowing that the, the funds are now flowing correctly uh, as intended. And if the pay, if the seller was to receive a payment from the distributor after the sale happens, we use that 10% withholding to then pay the investor what they otherwise should have been paid. Next question here, are the copyrights you deal in mainly US originated slash owned or are you exchanging in songs written slash recorded outside the US? Um, yeah, I mean, we work with, I think at this point, we've worked with artists from every continent except Antarctica, I believe. Uh, I can't think of any. Yep. Yeah. Pretty sure every continent. Um, there's no limitations, you know, as long as there are royalty earnings coming. Um, we, we may have to investigate if the royalty payor will allow for an assignment. Uh, that sometimes can be a blocker for us. But yeah, there's no... There's no limit for where in the world we can work. Uh, we've worked with artists all over the world. Sure, there's a lot of stuff that's US-based, but that's just because we're a US company. Um, we've worked with artists everywhere. 
Um, what are the best valuation techniques to determine fair value of a royalty stream? What is the current pricing environment? Uh, hopefully this whole analysis just answered that question. Um, there is no best valuation technique. It's what valuation technique works for you in your portfolio. We took a pretty standard approach uh, for how to evaluate this stuff. Um, but ultimately it's up to you. We're not financial advisors. We can't give you investment advice. We can't tell you what to do, what's good for you, stuff like that. Um, so I'm afraid a lot of that is up to you. All we can do is offer you strategies and ways to approach the data uh, that can help inform your valuations when you do them. Uh, Dayton or Rob, anything you guys want to add to that? Nope. Cool. Uh, next one here. How do you see the market for the next 12 months and five years? I mean, presumably it's going to keep growing. Um, so the, the, the baseline assumption here, again, falls to streaming. Um, streaming is growing every year. Spotify is growing every year. You can look up their growth stats. I think it's like a 12% every year, year over year growth that they're seeing. They're reaching emerging markets. They're reaching more places. Music's getting more accessible to more people. More people are getting smartphones and able to stream music directly from their phones. I mean, it's just growing all over the place. So big picture. I mean, it looks like everything's growing. 12 months, five years, expect everything to keep growing. The royalty rates are increasing. So the payouts are going to be bigger. I mean, like it's across the board, across the board bigger. I'd um, say the information and transparency that that kind of came with, with streaming, you know, if, if you're a creator, you can see how many times your song has been has been played. Yeah. Um, so kind of the, the information that's available to everyone, but, you know, particularly the creators is, is giving them a bigger stake, um, in the, in the earnings. And I think that's good, honestly, for everyone. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about the streaming environment, consider what's happening domestic where it's a mature market. So there's questions about what the pricing is going to be from the DSPs for their various packages. So that could have an impact on revenue there, positive or negative, but also think about, um, the reach into international markets where there are still areas of growth for uh, a lot of those foreign territories for the Spotify's and Apple's of the world. So there's, there's, you know, expected growth in the U S and, and there's definitely major areas to grow uh, by significant margins elsewhere in the world. Sure. Uh, next question here. I'm looking for general information about how <clears throat> the asset is managed and at what cost to the owner. Um, so the asset is managed just through the, publishers and artists the way it normally would be um but there is no cost to you uh, all the earnings that you see in any listing on royalty exchange are net of any collection fees or anything like that um so like of course there's a fee that's collected to collect the royalties but you never realize it when considering your investment everything you see is net um net for you uh and, next and royalty oh. exchange does not charge uh, a fee to administer right. the payments on your behalf of course yeah so yeah, should, shouldn't be anything for you to consider there. Uh, how are you thinking about a proper discount rate for various types of listings? Can't really answer that. Uh, it's kind of up to you and what you need and want in your portfolio. Yeah, so it's unfortunately up to you. We, we can't answer that one. Uh, what are the fastest growing categories of music? Hip hop, rock, country, et cetera. I don't know. I mean, think? fastest growing, like what, how do you define that metric? I mean, hip hop is, is well established at streaming, which is where you see most of the growth in, uh, you know, music today. Um, I would kind of see it as a rising tide lifts all boats sort of thing, uh, as more listeners migrate over to, to DSPs. I don't think that one asset is genre is really growing more than than any of the others unless you look yeah. at stuff by genre that is maybe slow to uh have adopted to the streaming environment so maybe that's country but you know the the analyses that we've done on genre impact uh at least with respect to valuations we don't see much really moving the needle uh which suggests that investors overall on the platform aren't really putting much of a premium positively or negatively on genre when they're considering the earnings um and i you know like i think as a rule of thumb just to kind of back up a little bit you know when you're looking at an asset don't necessarily you know if you want to filter by 
rock or hip hop, whatever criteria you want to use, we're going to give you that opportunity when you search for stuff on the platform. But I would really consider what an asset is based on the data that's on the listing and evaluate on a case by case basis. Uh, next question here, have transactions on the platform decreased with the increase of interest rates? <clears throat> Not that I've noticed. It's about, about the same, honestly. Again, people are looking for traditional market shelters, alternatives, ways of diversifying, and royalties is great for that. Um, yeah, transactions have not have not gone down. Uh, really, the transaction volume that we see is dependent on what we have available. Uh, if we have not a lot of stuff available, then transactions go down. If we have lots of available, transactions go up. Simple as that. The, the sale rate is pretty high. Uh, most stuff that comes available gets purchased by somebody. Uh, there's not a lot of places where you have the opportunity to buy. Uh, so since we do offer that, most stuff most stuff gets sold. Uh, what factors are considered in determining multiples? Everything you see. The age, the artist, the genre, the earnings, the trends, everything you see. Um, how you factor it into your analysis, it's up to you. Um, we like to look at the hard data, stuff like the actual earnings, where it's coming from, what's the age of the catalog, stuff like that. We like to be grounded in the data. How you weight stuff is up to you. Uh, what are the ways to estimate future depreciation on a listing? Uh, again, not one we can really answer. Um, we cannot make any claims or guarantees to the future performance of royalty assets, so we don't know. Our cash flow table, we bake in a decay rate just to be conservative, but it's not necessarily always appropriate. Um, safe to say that stuff does depreciate, but doesn't always. Uh, Dayton, anything you want to speak to depreciation and estimating future cash flows? Yeah, no, not, I don't think so. Not something we can really speak to. We, no. we can't. We can't make any claims or guarantees. Uh, next one here. Can multiple people be assigned ownership once purchased? Rob, you want to talk about the legalities there? Yeah, I mean, same kind of answer as, as we had before is, is you have to purchase uh, as an individual uh, or, or single entity. Um, what you do with it after you purchase it off the marketplace, um, you, you would be certainly welcome to to assign it to, to multiple people if you wanted. It, it just can't happen on the marketplace. Um, and then we also had another question is, can you can you invest uh, in a trust? or uh, assign it to a trust after the fact. And we've had investors that have done it both ways as, as they, they originate the, the purchase uh, in their trust uh, or they've assigned it to their trust after the fact. I think you'd probably wanna check with your uh, trust and estates attorney to make sure that that you're working within the confines of, of your uh, estate planning documents. But um, from our perspective, you could certainly do that either way. Yeah, just uh, let us know if you buy something and down the road you want to roll it into some other entity, we can get that set up for you. So just let us know. Okay, that just about does it for the submitted questions. Um, doesn't look like there's any more open questions submitted. Uh, so I'm going to call this webinar just about wrapped here. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I hope this was helpful for you. If you have other questions or things you want to talk about, um, if you want to run through a specific asset analysis, similar to like we did with this one, we can do that too. Just email us at investors at royaltyexchange.com. Um, once again, my name is John Gestel. I'm our client relations coordinator here. With me as always is Dayton O'Connor, our lead analyst, and Rob Bernhardt, our corporate counsel. Thank you all for attending. Um, this webinar is recorded and will be posted on the site. Uh, let us know if there's anything else we can help you with and have a good rest of your day. All right, take care, everyone.